Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Morris, and I'm sorry today that I do sound a little bit like Darth Vader, um, because <laughs> I'm not going to, in the middle of my speech, I'm not going to say, you know, Luke, I am your mother, or anything like that. But uh, I've had bronchitis this week, so I think it's Mother Nature's way of telling me maybe my, my voice sounds better huskier, or something like that. But um, I'm a writer, uh, I'm a journalist, and I ended up, I want to talk to you today about the power of storytelling and the fact that years before the mobile phones, before Twitter, before the fax machine, before telex, before the telegraph, we're actually bound together by our abilities to tell stories. Now, what brought me to Qatar was actually to become managing editor of the Peninsula newspaper. And I was the first woman managing editor in the region for a very long time. And as a Westerner occupying that position, and as a woman, I found myself telling my story all the time. Why are you here? Where do you come from? What are you doing here? And it's hard for a journalist to tell their own story because we actually do spend quite a lot of time telling everybody else's story. So I became a little bit adept at um, giving myself a, a little bit of a polish, um, my, my background a bit of a polish, but essentially my parents both wanted me to be a lawyer. And in Australia, where I'm from, uh, lawyers are considered pretty much on par with used car salesmen. And, and only marginally above them are journalists. So I thought I'd meet them halfway. I said, look, Mum and Dad, I want to be a journalist. And they said, yeah, OK. Um, so I became a journalist at age 21. And I've been doing that for most of my life now. I'm also a writer. And I have turned to the dark side, not Darth Vader, but um, to the dark side and moved into PR as well most recently. But the reason I pr primarily became a journalist is I love stories. I love hearing other people's stories. I love telling stories. And that primarily to me was what journalism was about. And I think sometimes we do lose track of that. So I came to Qatar. Um, I was living in Dubai for a couple of years. And I saw an ad. It's rather mysterious. It said, managing editor needed for a newspaper in Qatar. And I applied for the job. And next thing I knew, I was here. And I thought I could actually change a little bit of the world, a little bit like Amal. I wanted to change my little piece of the world and actually publish compelling stories from people here. Um, one day, I had been in the job about three months and I got a phone call on my office line from a man who said he'd like to speak to the editor. And I said, this is the editor. No, 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 no. I, I want to speak to the editor. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm the editor. And he said, no, I want to speak to the man. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm the editor, <laughs> but you're a lady. I said, yes. Last time I checked, women could edit newspapers as well as drive and various other things. So, and then he burst out laughing. And when I hung up the phone, he was still laughing. And sometimes I say I can still hear him <laughs> laughing somewhere in the background. <laughs> but um, I was under no illusions. I didn't really want to push the envelope too much. And I'm going to be honest about that. But occasionally, we did run stories that were a little bit sort of uh, fell f uh, foul of the authorities. And one day, one of my senior reporters got a, um, uh, a, a call. And they said, we want the editor and you to come down, because we want to talk to you about these stories that have been, you've been writing about some of the workers' complaints. And we just want to talk to you about them. Now, it's not obvious to you here, but I'm a bit of a drama queen. So <laughs> I thought, I've seen this before. I've seen this episode of Law and & Order. And next thing you know, I'm going to be cutting a deal with the DA. So I'm going to take a lawyer. So I took two lawyers, two senior reporters. And I think we dragged a T-boy along. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Went down there. I wore a red dress. I remember this very vividly. I wore a red dress, red lipstick, the whole thing. We went down to, the, to this pol uh, police headquarters to meet one of the senior guys there. And we walk in and introduced to the chief. And he looks a bit a bit taken aback at the, the crew. And I thought, oh, it's because I've brought all these people. And he said, we sat down, and there was a conversation that went on in Arabic. And I could, I could get some of it. And most of it was about the fact that I was actually the editor. And suddenly he said, so you're the editor? I said, yes. He goes, oh, OK. Please, sit down, have tea. So something that it actually I was expecting to be quite, uh, quite aggressive turned into something quite, quite. Uh, we, we left with a show bag, I believe. We had um, 
They had T-shirts and caps and everyone was happy. And I don't actually know why they called me down there for that reason. But, but at the end of the day, they were, it was, they were a little bit taken aback about me being a woman. But this, my tenure came to an abrupt end pretty quickly. And we all move on. But this is a very, um, I was actually quite devastated when, when I lost my job as editor of the paper. And that's another story for another time, another place. But why, what brings me to my point today is the reason I was able to get through that is because other people have gotten through it. I knew other people had gotten through it because of their stories and our ability to communicate with each other. So I found out when I, when I left that job how, much, how many friends I had here and how much support we had here. But at the end of the day, I'm an old school journalist and I'm still struggling with, with technology. And I was one of those ones who had to adapt to not just a new form of communicating with people, but also a new language. I get text messages from people, I don't actually understand what's, what's in them. <laughs> they use words, they use numbers in words, like great with an eight. I don't, I don't understand that. And people who do know me here know, there's some people here I see today who I know through my, through my Twitter account. And I'm really kind of obsessed with Twitter at the moment because I'm fascinated with my own ability to be able to communicate in less than 140 characters, which for a journalist and for somebody who's so overly verbose is quite, quite exciting. But I'm still really upset that Charlie Sheen won't follow me back. <laughs> and that there's a woman from the X Factor She's got pink hair, I think her name's Cher, Cher Lloyd. She won't follow me either. So <laughs> I'm hoping that one day I'll get followed by someone remotely famous. But I'm going to get to my central point now, and that is that it's no secret that digital communication has changed the way that we communicate with each other. The even fact that we're here today, most of the people found out about this event through social media. Uh, but it has also changed the way we have to tell our stories. There's a remarkable power in telling your own story, whether it be in the age of Twitter at 140 words or whether it be through a book. Um, but I think that Twitter, Facebook, phone calls, um, emails are just modern in incarnations of ancient forms of communication. Now, as I said, I'm Australian and the traditional owners of Australia have been, uh, have, have lived there for, for 40,000 years and that's the, the Aboriginal people. And they had, a, they had a way of communicating that dates back even further than Facebook. 40,000 years be before Mark, Mark Zuckerberg had Facebook, these guys had something called the song lines. Now, the Aborigines believe that during the dreaming, which is when the earth was created in their religion, at the start of time, there were these, these people called creator beings. Now, the beings actually used songs to create the landscape and to create people. So these songs formed paths across the landscape to mark a route, and that route was specific to that being. So the paths of the song lines are recorded in traditional songs, stories, and dance. Now, that for those people who don't know, the Aborigines don't actually have a written history. They have an oral history. So these song lines are all about preserving their heritage. Now, an elder is a person who has that knowledge. And so they're able to navigate themselves across the land by repeating the words of the song, which describe the location of landmarks. It might be a river. It might be um, another source of water. It might be a mountain or another natural phenomena. In some cases, the paths of the creators are said to be visible. So there is one legend where uh, somebody actually, where one of the, the beings, it was a kangaroo, lay down and died. And they say that you can see it, 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 that formed a hill in that particular part of the, the region. Now, by singing the songs in the appropriate sequence, they can actually navigate vast distances. And as you know, Australia is one of the biggest countries in the world. Now, often traveling through the deserts of the interior with no markers whatsoever other than these songs. So as long as you knew the protocol and you knew what was associated, there was uh, traditions often associated with each, with each song or each place, you could navigate those pathways and you could get through. So basically, there were no boundaries, as long as you knew what you were talking about. Now, the continent of Australia is actually crisscrossed by these. And one of the things that's really important to notice is that the Aboriginal people, we often quite talk about them as one people. 
but there are actually hundreds of different people with hundreds of different languages, and not all of them are similar. So it's not like French and Italian. They're actually quite different languages. But these song lines transcend those, those languages. Now, there's a um, British author called Bruce Chatwin. He's actually a travel writer, but he spent a lot of time with nomadic people in Africa and also Austra in Australia. I'm just going to read quickly from his book called The Song Lines about this labyrinth of pathways. The labyrinth of invisible pathways which meander all over Australia are known to Europeans as dreaming tracks or song lines, to the Aboriginals as footprints of the ancestors or way of the law. Aboriginal creation myths tell of the legendary totemic being who wandered all over the continent in dream time, singing out the name of everything that crossed their path, birds, animals, plants, rocks, waterholes, and so singing the world into existence. So, as I said, think of them as a series of signposts or a, se a series of signs telling you how to negotiate that pathway, those people, that land. So as an example, the Rainbow Serpent, which is for Australians is probably one of the most, most well-known Aboriginal legends. And it tra that the, the story transcends both European and, and English, uh, European and Aboriginals. Um, the Rainbow Serpent, they say, created much of Northern Australia, which is one of the most remote parts of Australia. And it was a woman. And she, she actually, well, she was a Rainbow Serpent, but she was in female form. She slithered across the landscape and created mountains. She created uh, streams and rivers. And it's quite an interesting, um, that is one of the most well-known pieces of landscape in Australia. So. In the Sydney region where I'm from, the song lines relate to navigating the coastline and the sandstone and where to find water. So imagine this, all these lines, these stories, Chris crossing the, crossing the land, in that part, the land that they knew, which was Australia, deserts and seas and wrapping around and around each other and you, allowing people to understand each other, allowing people to communicate with, with, with each other, removing the boundaries. So the con concept actually gets a little bit more interesting, and this is something I haven't explored too much, but um, when Chatwin and a couple of other ethnologists actually went over, have been to Africa and have been to other parts where there's nomadic people, and they found out that there are similar tales or similar folk tales that are told in Africa as well as other parts of um, Canada. So these all interconnect each other and tell similar stories. So how does this relate to us sitting here in Doha today? Um, I think that we write our own song lines every day, whether it be a tweet, an email, a phone call, or a Facebook update. And one of the other speakers, we were sitting in uh, the speaker's room earlier, and one of the other speakers who's going to give a fantastic presentation later on today, today is a fellow journalist, Ranwa. She was saying that um, in Egypt, they're creating history every minute through social media. So that in itself is a song line, the whole what, is, what was created around, around Egypt. So these messages are in digital voice, in written form, and they crisscross the globe every day in multitudes. And many of the stories are the same, many are unique. Some are mundane, some are history changing. What's happening in Egypt, what's happening in Libya, what's ha what happened in Tunisia. And I want to end today on the great psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. As a journalist, I don't like to think too much about analysing myself because it's a little bit of a scary concept. But he said that a person's power of communication actually enables them. He found that a person being given the freedom to tell their own story and being given a voice was a powerful agent for change, whatever situation you put them in. So by simply giving people an opportunity to talk, to communicate, to interact, whether they be in Doha, whether they be in Libya, whether they be in New Zealand, whether they be in Japan, helps them overcome boundaries. So we create ourselves through our own through these narratives. So finally, I just want to say that I believe that our ability to tell our own story, no matter what format, what language, makes us the people that we are. So thank you very much for listening to me today. And have a great day.